anyone can remember what we did last week? Anything? Anything that we handled last week? Something that you got from the study? Purpose for good health. Yeah. Any aspect on the purposes for good health? Purposes for good health? Anything that we recall? So today we want to see what, how do we think about some things that we get to undergo, be it suffering, be it sickness, serious diseases, some like cancer, mental illness and disabilities that we may incur or face. So we want to see how, how do we handle all this? How do we encourage those who undergo this? How do we uh, minister to those who undergo such? Someone can read Job 2.10. Job chapter 2, verse 10. Job 2.10. Amen. So, shall we receive good from God and not receive evil? That's a dangerous text. What, what, what do we mean, receive evil from God? What do we think that means? Shall we not receive evil? What do we think it means? We don't need an explanation to to understand how we receive good from God. But we may want to an explanation on how we receive evil or why we receive evil from God. Or what does that verse mean? Anyone? Sorry? Yeah, he, he allows even the evil that God allows in our that God allows in our lives, He has control over it. So that that means the evil that we face, even the sickness that we face. At this time, Job was had lost family, was stricken by boils and sickness. But Job recognizes that all the health that he received, what we looked at last week, and this sickness that he has received is permitted by God. That doesn't sound what we, we want or what we've had. How does God permit evil? And last week, last week we looked at where does sickness come from? By way of recap, who can remind us what we said about where sickness comes from? Where does sickness come from? Sickness? Where does sick... I'm sure we handled it last week, yeah? Yeah, I remember. Last week. Where does sickness come from? The fall. Yeah, Genesis 3. God has subjected all things to futility, as we'll see. And the sickness is a fruit of the fall, a fruit of the sinfulness 
that came from man. So yes, God created us without sickness. And just like death, sickness is a fruit of the fall. Death being the final enemy as it were. Sickness is part of the many things that come from the fall. Someone can read Romans 8, 19 to 23. Someone please read Romans 8. Romans 8. Amen. Thank you. So, we, the creation has been subjected to futility. And what this, this groans, what are these groans, or what causes these groans that Paul here says that, uh, verse 22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Not just the creation, but we ourselves. What are these groans? What would you make of that? What does it mean? What are these groans? What do you understand by that? A longing, yeah. It's like a verbal displeasure. Like it's a verbal displeasure of things are not okay. And that communicates a longing to something. So the creation, and this is animating what, what we would understand, when we say groaning is not that the earth makes those sounds, but it communicates that things are not okay. And why are things not okay? Because of the fall. Why are we, who are the first fruits, not okay? Because of the fall, because of sin. And who subjected the whole creation to futility? Stay in the verse. Who subjected the whole creation to futility? Or who has? Who has subjected? Anyone? Adam? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Subjected it in? Verse, verse 21. No. Verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, 
but because of him, uh, that will give us a hint who that is. Adam, yes, was, was a big player in this thing, but who, who allowed, let's say that, who allowed, and we can also say who subjected it in futility? The creator God. And that's the last, that's the last answer James will give. No more answers. <laughs> anyway, uh, so we see the creator God subjected it in futility. Why? Why did he subject the whole creation to futility? In hope, hope of setting them free, that's good. Yeah, setting them free from sin to, to him. To him in a whole new effort of recreation. So the whole creation is subjected to futility. And this futility is what we see the world decaying, we see the diseases, we see the earthquakes, everything, the thorns and thistles that we saw in Genesis 3, all these things, they are brought, it's the subjection of this universe, this earth, to futility. But even that, it's not hopeless. He subjects it in hope. And the hope is only found in him. And the hope in him is now achieved first through the recreation of souls, through the regeneration of souls, through the death of Christ. Then secondly, we read, as we'll read in, towards the end, he will make all things new. All things new. So, yes, there is the hope, and the hope is for us not to set our satisfaction, our enjoyment in anything created, in anything on earth. Even in heaven, anything in heaven that is not God. So the creation has been subjected to futility. And... So the most, the most loving thing God could have done or has done once sin separated us from him was to ensure that we could not find meaning in anything but him. So our hope is not even in the recreated world if God is not there. Our hope is not in the new bodies, if these new bodies will not be lived with Christ, in, with, with the, in the presence of Christ. There is no need. There is no need for the healing of our bodies if we will not live those healed lives with Christ. That's the point of everything. And that is what we want to study today. So there's a, there's a quote from this study by Piper. And Piper has a good booklet, uh, around 18 pages, on Don't Waste Your Cancer. It's, it's an excellent resource as to if you're seeking understanding and to know how to care for those with cancer and how to care for those who need or if you are having a loved one who, is, who has cancer. So he says, it will, not, it will not do to say that God only uses our cancer, but does not design it. Ooh, that, that, that's something. What God permits, he permits for a reason. And that reason is his design. If God foresees molecular developments becoming cancer, he can stop it or not. If he does not, he has a purpose. Since he is infinitely wise, it is right to call for this purpose a design. Satan is real and causes many pleasures and pains, but he is not ultimate. 
Remember what we spoke about God allowing sin, God allowing sickness rather. He is not ultimate. Remember, as Martin Luther said, even the devil it's, is God's devil. The devil is not sovereign. So when he strikes Job with boils, Job 2.7, Job attributes it ultimately to God. Chapter 2, verse 10. And the inspired writer agrees they comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought him. Job 42.11. If you do not believe your cancer is designed for you by God, you'll waste it. That's, we, can, we, can, we can replace that word with the sickness that we are undergoing, and it will change a lot. What do you think of that quote? It's, it's a heavy one, because we, we want to believe that God brings only good things. And it's, it's true. In the end, it will be for your good. In the end, it will definitely be for your good and for his glory. What do we think about that, that quote, the excerpt from Don't Waste Your Cancer? What do you think? Any comment from that quote? Is it, is it what we normally think of our sickness? Is it the norm to think of your sickness in that manner? That this has been designed and sent by God for his purposes. Yes? Did I tell James not to answer then he left? No, he didn't leave. Anyway, <laughs> any, anyone? No, yes? Yeah, we, that's not how we think about things. We want it to be good now, and we want to see it now. Yet it's painful. Sometimes it may lead even to death. And you're telling me that it's good. It's, it doesn't work that way. But remember, the whole creation is subjected to futility in hope. The hope is to be with him. Any questions before we... Go on. Any questions? All right. So God's purposes in... Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. I, I get the struggle, and that's, yeah, that's, that's more of the language used, and I understand how, what, where that is coming from. When we say designed, and I'll read this, a, a portion of the quote, uh, so Piper says, and of course, these are fallible words. This is not infallible in any aspect. These are just words of a man trying to make sense of what we undergo. So he says, what God permits, he permits for a reason. And that reason is his design. So don't maybe understand design. You can say design is allowing. We can say that. But also remember that he is sovereign. There is no molecule, there is no cell that is there not by his design, not by his allowing, not even by his guiding. 
there is, if, if there is anything that is out of God's control, then he is not sovereign. So, and I don't want to inch further into where evil came from because we'll be here for the next year. So we, we, it's wise to know that since, not if, since God is sovereign, nothing is out of his reach. I hope that makes sense. So, yes, you can say it's allowing, but also have the framework that God is sovereign over everything, even that which the devil does. Thank you for that. Any other? Yes, John. This. That's, that's really good. Not, not all the time that we fall sick, we can blame the devil. We, we need to be careful. And we need to, to understand that, that sickness is not from the devil, even though it may be, but we don't know. So the, let the secret things remain to God as Deuteronomy would exhort us. Since we don't know, and since God is sovereign, we can now rest knowing that if it comes from the devil, just like Job's, or if God allows it, like many other countless times, the goal is to be faithful. The goal is to endure and to understand it is subjected to futility for our hope. That's, that's the goal. Hope that's clear. Thank you. So, what are God's purposes in poor health? What are God's purposes in our poor health? We mentioned this last week, uh, but we can recap them again. God's purposes in our poor health. Anyone? Why does God allow poor health and this sickness? Conform us to the image of Christ. Yes, yes. Something else? Anything? Yes, Maggie. Yeah, our hope. That's true. They give us a longing for heaven. The sickness gives us a longing for heaven. That's true. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Yes, Seth. Yeah, to trust in the Lord. That's true. That's true. To trust in the Lord in everything, even when our bodies are failing. Anyone else? Yes, Maggie. It gives the church an opportunity to serve you, even by prayer. That's, that's good. Any moment to commune with God is a good moment. Mm -hmm. That's true. Anyone else? Anyone else? Those are good answers. So the first one is, just like we said, because this sickness is because of sin, and not understand, we are not saying the person's sins, but we are saying the sin that is in the world. And since the sickness and the suffering and death that we experience is a fruit of sin, so this sickness reminds us of sin and reminds us to hate the sin. 
that's when when you're sick how how often do you remember that this is not the natural order this is not how things were supposed to go but because of sin now we have sickness we have thorns we have thistles we have pain we have tears it reminds us to hate the sin the second thing is what Seth has said to trust in the Lord. It wins us from self-sufficiency. Basically, that means you are reminded that actually your body is decaying and you are not as strong as you thought you are. You are not as immortal as sometimes you are, you are, you are tempted to think. Someone can read 2 Corinthians 1.8. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. 2 Corinthians 1, 8. If you get it, you can read. Mm -hmm. For we do not want you to be unaware, brother, unaware brothers of the afflictions we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Sorry, I asked you to read eight. It, sorry, sorry. It should have been all the way to verse 10. But that was to make us not to rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. So why did God allow this suffering? Why did God allow this affliction to Paul and the rest? Any thoughts? It's there in the text. Rely on him, yeah. Not ourselves. If, if that affliction would not have come, maybe Paul, very human, would have relied on himself, would have relied on even others, the arm of flesh. So Paul was afflicted, they were afflicted to remind them not to rely on themselves. And this, this brings us to the moment, have you ever been sick to the point that you are not even, or even encourage someone who is sick to the point that you don't even see if you will make it. Even the doctors don't seem to be helping. They may help, but even them, the working of those medicine, it's only because God allows it. Have you ever experienced such a place, been in an, in an experience whereby you feel you're in a place whereby you can't even rely on anyone else but God. Has sickness ever moved you to that place? Where it's only God. If the Lord doesn't come through, you're going to meet him, which is good. But you realize that you can't depend on your arm or flesh. And that's why we are saying that's the goal, that's the motive, that's, that's why God would allow sickness. Purpose number three, as Maggie said, poor health gives us opportunity to serve, gives others opportunities to serve. And that's, that's true. And I remember someone, and I think I've mentioned it before, 
there is pride in not serving and there is also pride in not willing to be served. It cuts both ways. So as much as you want to serve and be there for everyone, sometimes the Lord will slow you down to be served and have others serve you. Someone can read Galatians 4, 13 to 15. Galatians chapter 4, verse 13 all the way to 15. Fifteen. Amen. So, of course, Paul here is challenging and rebuking the Galatians all the way from chapter one, but now he gives us a glimpse of their past interaction. And yes, Paul was sick. Some may think that he had an eye problem, an eye ailment, but we don't know. It's speculation. But that helped. You remember last week, the purpose of sickness sometimes is to help us even serve others. But now we are looking at others serving us. And Paul witnessed this from the Galatians. His interaction, his initial interaction with the Galatians was that they were even willing to do anything for him. To the extreme that Paul says, if it were possible, whether it's a figure of speech or not, it's still extreme, that they would have gouged out their eyes and given them to Paul. And this is why people believe this is an eye problem. But anyway, whether it's a figure of speech or a reality, they wanted to serve Paul. They were longing to serve Paul because of his ailment. So sickness sometimes can rally people around us to serve us. And we should accept that. We should be willing to accept even that. So... In that point, there are three practical things that we ought to remember that we need to be reminded, as people serve us, we need to be reminded that our worth is not in productivity. When you are sick and feeling like you are burdened and useless, that's not the case. Your worth is not in what you can do. Your worth your identity is in Christ. That's the first goal. Our worth is not in what we do, but who Christ, who we are in Christ. So when you're sick, when you feel you can't do anything, everyone is doing something for you, it's okay. The Lord has allowed that for a purpose. The second thing is this moment that you are depending on others Use it to glorify the Lord. Praise the Lord for faithful brothers, sisters, relatives who are around you to support you. And also the third thing is that encourage the faith of others. As they serve you, be of much encouragement to them. Any question in that? Any question in that regard? Mostly as, as we deal with sickness giving us, giving others opportunity to serve us. Any question?
the fourth thing. So we've said purpose number one is that we might hate sin, why God allows sickness to hate sin. The second purpose. Anyone remember? To drive us off our self-sufficiency, to not rely on ourselves, but God who raises the dead. The third thing, we've just mentioned it, opportunity to be served. So the fourth thing is poor health makes us long for heaven, as Maggie said. So when we are suffering and we see that actually this, this earth, this world is not our home, there, there has to be something else. There has to be something else that causes you there has to be more than what we are facing right now. And that is our hope. The hope is us in Christ. And we looked at 1 Corinthians 4 last week. And so now we see that sickness, even though allowed by God, it is for a purpose. And that purpose, this specific time, is to make us long for heaven. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 2. Someone can read that for us, please. 2 Corinthians 5, 2. Anyone? Second Corinthians chapter five, verse two. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for that, Catherine. For in this tent. Paul calls our bodies tents, for in this clothing, in this housing of, that we have, we groan. Remember the language in Romans 8, the whole, the whole creation groans, longing to be put on our heavenly dwelling, longing to be put on our glorified bodies, longing for heaven. Sickness can help us long for that. Sickness can be designed to have us have a heavenly vision. And that's, that's what 1 Corinthians 4 that we read last week, that's, that's what it is. Our outer body is wasting away. The, this, this body is wasting away because of sickness, old age, basic wear and tear and that's that's what it is we are being prepared for the grave but as a Christian we know that that is not the end that is not all there is we are not living this life to enjoy and make our bodies the best and that's it we are living this life for the glory of God knowing that it's being wasted, the body is being wasted away by sickness, knowing that one day he will give us glorified bodies. He will transform these sick, ridden bodies to be like his. We long for that day. Any questions on the purposes as we conclude? Any, anything? Questions, comments, testimonies? So, how many have been sick before? 
Okay, let me ask. It looks like how many have not been sick? Okay, nobody. That's better. And how or do we have people that we know that are sick? Now you may not be sick, but do we have loved ones that are sick? Definitely we have. So how would you encourage them? How would you have them live as faithful stewards? Remember the topic you are handling is stewardship. How would you have them live as faithful stewards? Any, any pointers? We spoke about this last week. We can recap again. Anyone? Yes, sir. Amen. That's true. Visitation, a letter, a card. So if you, if you are sick, if, if you are unwell, one thing that, we, that you can be reminded of is be willing to accept a different role. And that's how the Lord has allowed it. And an example is given here of a lady in a certain church who she used to serve her church diligently. She was good in hospitality. She did everything well. But when she got sick, she could no longer have the ministry of hospitality going on that she used to do. So what did she take up? She took up writing encouraging letters and cards to the congregation. That's the thing she could do because she was confined to her bed and to her room. So the, the best thing she could do is write letters and uh, cards. And when the pastor of this church asked how many people had received encouraging notes and letters, almost everyone had received an encouraging letter from this lady. She took up a different role from what she was used to. The sickness confined her to a different place. But even in that place, she was still faithful, still a faithful steward, and still able to minister. The other thing is be wise in taking action. The approach here is if anyone among us is unwell, but also this can be a way to encourage those who are sick. Be wise in taking action. This means that if it's medication, if it's therapies, if it's the things that the doctors have recommended, you can use those means that the Lord has graced these people with education, with the know-how, by using this means even to seek medication. That's one thing. The third thing, as we said, is to trust God, to know that the goal, of, the goal is not really for God to persevere our bodies. The goal is not God to persevere these bodies. After all, he has said that they are falling, they are wasting away. The goal is for God to persevere our faith. Our faith needs to stand firm and know that the Lord is building, him, building us up. That's the goal. So be it in life, be it in sickness or death, our faith has to stand firm. And the last thing is to keep our mind focused on heaven. 
there is no there is no need of suffering sickness in this world and then suffering eternity in hell yet to profess to be a believer it it doesn't work that way so let this be the hardest season of this life and the life to come. Any questions before we close? Any questions? Someone can read for us Revelation 21 as we are reminded to long for heaven, to focus on heaven, let's be reminded what will happen on that day. Revelation 21, verse 3 to 5. Revelation 21. A minute. Hera Shouta. You can start again. Sorry. Sorry. Don't. Amen. Thank you, Hera. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you have not only told us why you've allowed sickness and suffering, but even more how then we are to live as those who are redeemed, those who know you, those that are named by your name. We pray that, Lord, even as we suffer sickness, even as we have sick among us, Lord, we pray that you'll remind us of these truths. And even all the more, even though you haven't promised in your word to bring relief and healing now, we trust that one day you will make all things new. You will wipe away the tears of the suffering, the tears of sickness, the tears of death, Indeed, as the creation groans, we groan together knowing that one day you'll make all things new. So help us and be with us. We pray for the sick among us. We pray for Pastor James, pleading with you that you may heal him, pleading that you may encourage him and be of much help and grace to him. Even as he ministers to us, and he models all that we've learned today. May you be with him. We pray even for those others that are sick, remembering Daka's mom. We pray for her and the dad and the family as they seek to care and encourage her. Be with them and provide all the grace and the strength to do it. For Lisa's sister, for Irene's mom, for Kasomo's dad, for Felista's mom, and for many others that are among us that are unwell. Lord, we commend them all to you, knowing that you have allowed this, knowing that you have allowed this for their good and for your glory. May we be them that love them, may we be them that encourage them and care for them. So remind us of your goodness. Remind us even on 
of heaven and the day that you'll make all things new. And it's in Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you.